Now in my previous video on icebergs melting, you will know that their melting contributes very little to the amount of water in the oceans, really contributing only a small portion to the sea levels to rise over time. But what is causing sea levels to rise? Now there are three main things that are affecting sea levels. The first is melting, but of land ice. The second, and by far the greatest contributor, is what's called thermal expansion of the oceans. And the third is something called glacial isostatic adjustment. Most of this video we're going to look at the physics of thermal expansion, but I do want to look at the other two as well. Just before we start, let's quickly go over how we know sea levels are rising. Now, we think about the amount of water on Earth as a lot, but compared to the Earth itself, it's rather small. If I were to reduce the size of the Earth to the size of, let's say, a bowling ball, it will be as smooth as the bowling ball. The Marianas Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean, has a depth of about 11 kilometers. But at this scale, it would be no more than a scratch of 0.2 millimeters. And so you wouldn't even feel it in terms of this. Now, if we then took all the water on Earth, and not only the seas and the oceans, but also water in the atmosphere and the land, in terms of the bowling ball, well, that's about seven mils of water. And 96% of that is the ocean seas and bays. Now, if I were to spread that water over my bowling ball, it would be incredibly thin. So measuring that thinness would be very much of a challenge. Now, the second issue is the seas, of course, are not static. They're constantly moving with tides and weather systems and so forth. And so the water fluctuates. So how the heck are we going to measure the sea levels with some great precision? Now, there are two systems in play. The first are tidal gauges. Now, these are stations situated on coastlines that monitor water levels and are fitted with things called stilling wells that basically give a constant reading regardless of what's happening at the surface. There are about 1,450 tidal gauges around the world, and they've provided data for over 200 years, some back as far as 1700. The basic design hasn't changed much, but generally with technology improving, their precision has improved greatly. Now, tidal gauges only measure what we call relative sea levels, not absolute ones. So this is where satellites come in. They measure sea levels by sending microwave bursts down to the surface and then recording the time it takes for them to return. So by comparing their distance to the position above the Earth's center, they can determine the actual sea level by comparing the readings with their position. Now, both methodologies have an error of about a centimeter or so. So how the heck can scientists say that we can see that the sea levels are rising by two mils a year? The answer to that is that by taking averages of those readings and then graphing them over time, we can see a trend in our data. This graph from the CSIRO shows the average sea level since 1880. Now the green region shows the confidence range and you will note that this, as we approach recent times, this precision increases. Now the first thing you should note is that there is an upward trend. Sure, there are local fluctuations, but the overall trend is an increasing sea level. And the second thing you should note is that the graph curves. In other words, the rate is increasing. Although there again, there are variations within the scientific community as to what will happen in the coming decades, there's an overwhelming consensus that the sea levels will continue to rise. So now let's move on to the main cause of sea levels rising. The first is relatively easy to explain. In my ice weeks video, I discussed the melting ice in the sea will contribute relatively small amounts to the global sea level. But what if that ice was on land? If land-based ice in the form of snow and glaciers were to melt and not be replenished by the same amount in snowfall and other forms of uh, rainfall, then the melting will continue to contribute to the sea level rise. Now, there are two main concerns for scientists for melting land ice. One is the Antarctic and the other is Greenland. Through the use of satellite imagery, the Antarctic has been shown to be losing about 152 cubic kilometers of ice per year since 2002, while Greenland has been losing about anywhere between 150 to 250 cubic kilometers per year. Now, as you can see on the graphs, although there is some variations from year to year, both show an overall trend in loss. And from this, we can determine that there has been about a 15 millimeter increase in sea levels due to ice melt. Now, before I go on, I do want to address a common claim by some climate deniers. And they say, hey, the ice in the Antarctica is actually increasing and not decreasing. 
What they don't tell you often is, is that they are referring to sea ice. And we know that sea ice increase and uh, decrease don't contribute much to sea levels rising. And what is actually reducing is the land ice, which is the significant proportion leading to sea levels rise. Make sure that when you see certain claims online, make sure you investigate whether they're leaving any important relevant information out. Now, the second contributor is the main cause of the sea level rise, and that's thermal expansion. Water, like any substance, expands when it gets warmer. Now, I wanna demonstrate this with a very simple experiment. Now what I'd like to do is show you a very simple demonstration to show the relationship between temperature and volume, in this case, of water. And what I have here is a bottle which I've raided from the kitchen and it is basically filled with water with a food dye in it. I've also inserted a tube here which is sealed in the lid and this tube basically goes into the liquid. I have here a uh, digital thermometer which I've connected to my iPad and you can see currently it's 16.7 degrees. And I'm going to get here a heat lamp. And a heat lamp is going to give us a lot of heat. And that heat should go into the water. And we should see the temperature rise. But what's going to happen in the tube? Let's watch. Now the temperature has risen already. It's now 17.3 degrees. And if you look very closely here, we are starting to see some liquid go up the tube because the water is expanding and of course though it has nowhere to go in the bottle, so the only way is to up the tube. So the water is definitely expanding. The temperature is now 18 degrees and we might have to speed up the video a bit. So there you have it, a really clear demonstration that as we increase the temperature of the water, that is, as we put energy into the system, the water expands. Now, why is that? That's simply because of the water molecules. They're moving faster. The energy we're putting into the system here is being converted into the kinetic energy of the particles. Now, the volume is allowed to change. So hopefully the pressure stays the same. But as a result of the volume changing, we're finding that our liquid goes up the tube. And if I wanted to be a quantitative in this experiment, I could actually measure the amount of liquid here and relate that to the temperature change that we have here. As you can see, it's now currently at 28 degrees. And we could actually graph the relationship between the change in temperature and also the change in volume. And we will find that the volume change related to the temperature change is not a linear one. That is, it is a curved relationship. It actually expands at a greater rate at higher temperatures than at lower temperatures. So how does this relate to sea levels rising? Let's talk about that. Now, water has a high specific heat capacity. That is, it's able to store a large amount of energy for only a small increase in temperature. Now, I have a video on that particular topic, specific heat capacity, and you can click on the link above or look at the description below. So on a global scale, over 90% of the heat trapped in our atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans and therefore causing the average temperatures to rise. Now, how much? This graph from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration shows the average surface over ocean temperature has risen in the last 100 years or so by an average of about 0.13% per decade. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but again, let's have a look at the physics. So we know that as a substance temperature increases, its volume changes, that is, it expands, and that's simply because of the kinetic theory. Now, of course, water is a little bit different. If I show you the graph where we just deal with this small portion down here, you can see here that this trend of decreasing temperatures is decreasing volume suddenly changes. That is, the volume increases as we go below four degrees. And that's, again, unique to water. Water is a bit weird in that it expands as it drops below four degrees. But the point I want to make here is, is that we have a relationship between the temperature 
and the volume. And there's a mathematical relationship. Now, in terms of our substances here, we're dealing with liquids. And so the formula for the relationship between the change in volume and the change in temperature is a fairly straightforward formula. And that says the change in volume is equal to the initial volume multiplied by beta multiplied by delta t. Now, beta is the coefficient of thermal expansion and different substances have different coefficients. So if I now divide my delta V over V and I then have here a fractional increase, I now can see that it's simply related to beta multiplied by the change in temperature. Now this is a linear relationship because B is a constant, but we have a curve here. What's going on? Well, again, water has to be different in that its coefficient of thermal expansion isn't a constant number. It actually changes depending on the temperature. So as we increase in temperature, you can see carefully that the coefficients of thermal expansions is actually increasing. So if I plot this on a graph, I get this lovely curve. So we're gonna use this to look at the expansion of the oceans, and we're gonna use some rough figures here. The first thing is I'm going to just choose a temperature of 15 degrees. Now, I'm not saying that the global temperature of the water is 15 degrees, but I'm just dealing with the mathematics here. We're gonna use 15 degrees as a, as a ballpark figure. Now, if we use that value, we can just read this up and read this across here, and I'm going to get a coefficient of thermal expansion of around the point 00015. So that's our beta, and that is our temperature. So now let's have a look at mathematics. So we know conservative estimates says that we have an approximate 0.13% increase per decade. So that results in a 1.3% average for the 100 years. So now that we have an increase in temperature for the 100 year period, let's see how that affects the volume. So let's start first of all with our 15 degrees and we need to increase by 1.3%. Now I'm not going to do the mathematics, but you end up getting a temperature of 15.195 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to round this off. This is an approximate 0.2 degree increase in temperature. So now what we wanna do is to work out the change in volume as a fraction. So the change of volume over the original volume gives us our coefficient of thermal expansion multiplied by the change in temperature, which we've just worked out, is equal to 0.2. So that means we have 0.00015 multiplied by 0.2, and I'm gonna get a value of three by 10 to the power of negative five. That is the fractional increase in terms of the volume. Now that's not a lot. So if I multiply this by 100, that is, we have three by 10 to the power of negative three. Well, that's my percentage increase or 0.003% increase in volume. Now that's not a lot from this perspective, but let's place a scenario to help us appreciate what it might happen. So I'm gonna make a dish and this dish is a dish that's a very large dish. So it's going to have the dimensions of 100,000 kilometers across this way, and also 100,000 kilometers this way. And I want my volume to be the volume of all the water that we have, which is 1.3 billion cubic kilometers in terms of the volume of water. So the height of this dish, and I am not drawing it to scale, is going to be here 130 meters in height. That will give me the volume I need in order to hold all the water on this planet, which is around 1.3 billion cubic kilometers. I'm now going to increase the volume by this amount. So my 1.3 billion cubic kilometers, if I basically add the 0.003%, again, you can do the mathematics, this is going to give me a value of 1.3039 billion cubic kilometers of volume. Now, if I keep my dish here, so that the dimensions are exactly the same. That is, I 
I'm going to keep this boundary and this boundary the same. What height of the dish do I need to have to accommodate the extra volume that, you know, that is in this perspective right so? So if you do the mathematics, you can see the mathematics will say that your height now has to be 130.39 meters in height. In other words, what we have is that we have an increase of 39 centimeters. So our 1.3% increase over 100 years has resulted to an increase of 0.2 degrees Celsius which is then culminated in a 0.003% increase in the volume. That means we have an increase of 39 centimeters as a result. Of course, our oceans aren't rectangular prisms, but the premise is the same. For all intents and purposes, the ocean basin isn't changing in its volume. So any increase in volume of the water will cause a vertical height into increasing sea levels. Now, one last factor we need to consider. An often asked question is, why don't we see sea levels rising the same amount everywhere? Some areas have seen an increase and some a decrease and some have stayed the same as this image shows. Now, there is a number of reasons why this is the case, but I'm going to touch on one briefly. However, I will put a few links in the description if you want to research it further. Let me give you a simple analogy. Imagine sitting on a mattress and your weight will obviously push the mattress down but you'll note that the other side might rise slightly. When you get up, of course, your side lifts up, but the other side will drop slightly. Well, this is what's happening with the loss of glacial ice in the last ice ages. As the ice retreated, the land underneath is springing up and the effect is called glacial isostatic adjustment. What does it look like? Now here we have our continent here with our ice from the ice age sitting on top of the continent and we here we have the sea level here and of course this ice is quite heavy and it will apply a force in the downward direction like so but that ice is going to melt so it's going to disappear and the continents are going to respond like our mattress two things are going to happen first of all the mountains or the land will start to rebound in that direction but as that happens, the seafloor also responds in the opposite direction. So the end result is, is we're going to see a situation like this. So the mountains rebound, the sea level basin increases, and now what we have here is a decrease in the sea level over here. And so when we measure the sea levels, we have to account for this glacial isostatic rebound. So, when scientists combine all the known contributors to sea levels, that is thermal expansion, land ice melt, and of course a small portion by the sea ice melt, then they have to adjust for glacial isostatic adjustment. Scientific consensus is clear. Global temperatures are rising due to climate change. Most of that increasing energy is absorbed by the Earth's oceans, causing its temperatures to rise. And that, of course, impacts sea levels, which I've shown. And that will have consequences on coastal populations, consequences on marine ecosystems, which are sensitive to temperature, and, of course, weather systems that are also affected by ocean systems as well. But I guess that's a topic for another video. My aim here was to look at some of the physics principles behind sea levels rising and help you understand the science better. And I hope that's been achieved. If it has, please make sure you press the like button and remember to subscribe, ringing the bell so that you can get updates from my latest content. And look out for another video on climate change where I will discuss the blue ocean event. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Take care. Bye for now.